Welcome to Fiction and Story. I stepped into the restaurant and looked around. At a corner table, I found my ex-wife, but her husband was nowhere in sight. It had been ten years since our divorce, and I must admit that I still had trouble being around her. I kept going back and forth about whether I should meet with her. I finally decided to have the meeting. I just hope it isn't a mistake. My ex-wife still looked good, but the years were starting to take their toll. I also noticed that she appeared to be very nervous. I remember back to the day when my marriage and my life collapsed. It took years and many hours of therapy to get my head screwed back on right. It all started at the medical clinic. Mr. Williams, your report is ready, the receptionist called. I almost didn't hear her as I was lost in a funk I didn't know if I would ever get out of. Slowly, I rose and went to the reception window. A charge slip slid across the counter, which I signed. Then the envelope was handed to me. I looked at it with growing fear. It was a nondescript envelope with just my name, Justin Williams, on the outside. Yet, I knew that the contents would probably destroy my life. Numbly, I walked across the street to a park and found a secluded bench. I didn't even notice the drizzle or the wetness of the bench. I was just focused on that envelope. Then with trembling hands, I ripped it open. The report was filled with a lot of words I didn't understand. Still, the things that registered with me were the fact that this was a DNA test and that four individuals had been tested to learn what their relationship with each other was. One, of course, was my DNA. The other three were my wife, Amber, daughter, Jennifer, and son, Todd. It took me three times to finally understand what the report was saying. My two children were obviously related to their mother and had the same father. However, I wasn't that father. I broke down and started to cry. After 17 years of marriage, to find out that my life had been one big goddamn lie was too much. I didn't know what to do or what to think. Yes, it had been a shotgun wedding, sort of. Amber had gone with Jimmy Swanson for most of high school. I used to think he was a pretty nice guy. He also used to be the quarterback of our football team. That's not as big a deal as it sounds because we usually had a crappy team. I should know because I was the starting middle linebacker. Since our high school was relatively small, if you went out for the team, you suited up. I was a substitute my first year but a starter for the next three years. The first three years, our team managed to win a total of five games. But my senior year, for whatever reason, we went 6-2 and won the regional championship 9-7. Jimmy was absolutely shitty that day, but the defense came up big. But the season ended abruptly when we got destroyed in the divisional round. Jimmy and Amber had been an item for as long as I could remember. But then something happened, and they split up a couple of weeks before graduation. Then Jimmy left town to join the military. He would pop back occasionally until he finally left the army after nine years and settled back in the area permanently. After the graduation ceremony, I was at one of the parties to celebrate our liberation from high school when I ran into Amber. She actually approached me, and before I knew it, we were screwing our brains out. In my mind, this was a one-off opportunity, and my little head wouldn't pass it up. In truth, I expected that to be the sum total of our relationship. However, that couldn't have been further from the truth. For weeks after our romp, Amber cornered me at the pizza shack. She was pregnant and I was the father. That was another time that I didn't know what to think, or what to do, or what to say. However, I didn't cry. Instead, I went and talked to my dad. It was the most difficult conversation I've ever had with him. He, of course, was disappointed in me, but he wanted me to do the honorable thing. So, we got married. Even though we were both 18, Amber didn't want to let her parents know she was pregnant until after we were married. My father made the arrangements, and we eloped to the next state two days later. Amber called her parents from our honeymoon, if you could call it that, three days in a Best Western hotel. They were less than pleased but quickly adapted to the new situation. Amber's parents, Fred and Janice Burton, were a very conservative couple that came from old money. Still, they had very traditional values and tried to instill a strong work ethic in their kids. Fred was a bank vice president, and his wife, Janice, was a stay-at-home mom. They had three kids, Julie, Sarah, and Amber, with Amber being the youngest. It took a few years, but eventually, the Burtons warmed up to the idea of us being married and started to like me. Over the years, I became very close with Amber's parents, especially Fred. 
He often told me that he considered me the son he never had. So, I was deeply upset when Mr. and Mrs. Burtons were killed in a car accident five years after we got married. My married life with Amber wasn't all rainbows and unicorns. She could be very moody and demanding. And when Amber was displeased with me, she thought nothing of withholding sex. In fact, we only had sex once or twice a week anyway, and if she was mad at me, we could go for weeks with no sex at all. I'm sure many would wonder why I would put up with that. Well, to be brutally honest, I was totally naive. Plus, I was in love. I was very young when I got married and had only had sex with two other girls before Amber told me she was pregnant. So, I thought this was normal, and I thought Amber loved me in her own strange way. However, there were times when I'd reach my breaking point and tell Amber I was thinking about divorce. Then things would be better for a while. Before I got married, I had been accepted to Florida State University, but that plan went out the window. Instead, I enrolled in the local college majoring in business administration and marketing. To pay the bills, my father hired me to work for his mail order business. He had started it and built it up into a multi-million dollar business. My father's company sold high-end, name brand camping, or fishing equipment. I started at the bottom, but my father paid me enough for us to get by. Amber refused to work until Todd was old enough to go to preschool. Then she took a job as a real estate salesperson. But to me, it was more like a hobby for Amber as the most she ever made in a year was $11,000. She was definitely not one of their top salespersons, as she was never terribly motivated. I paid all the bills and made more each year as I moved up in my father's company. As I sat on the bench, it was crystal clear to me now that I had been played all those years ago. And I knew instantly that the biological father of my kids was Jimmy Swanson. But I was confused as to why Amber would stay with me. I could understand her being embarrassed at being pregnant and not married. Knowing her parents, the blowback would have been really bad. But after Jennifer was born, Amanda could have divorced me, and I doubt her parents would have batted an eye. And then to have another child with Jimmy three years later was crushing. There had to be more to what was going on than I knew. Are you all right? A voice intruded into my grief. When I looked up, I found a policeman in a rain slicker staring down at me. His name tag identified him as Officer Sullivan. He watched me as I nodded. I expected him to move along, but instead, he sat down. Do you want to talk about it? He asked as he draped his arm over the back of the bench. Sometimes it helps if you talk about your troubles. At the very least, it can't hurt. I thought about it for a second and decided why not. I had to talk to someone, so why not a stranger? Wiping my eyes, I then explained to Officer Sullivan my discovery that my wife had cheated on me and that my two kids weren't mine. Wow, he said, shaking his head slowly. And I thought my ex-wife was the coldest-hearted witch in the world. After my divorce, I discovered that she had cheated on me on the day of our wedding. Oh, she was very careful, but if she felt like screwing someone, she screwed them. I was married to her for five years before I caught on and caught her with a detective from my own precinct. I walked in on them while they were in mid-sex. That sleazy detective Peterson tried to climb out the window, but I caught him by his hair and dragged him back into the room. Then I slammed his nose on the floor, breaking it. Blood went everywhere, and Peterson rolled around moaning. Throughout the whole thing, my wife just sat on the bed and smirked. Right then, I knew I had to get out of there, or I'd kill the witch. What happened? I asked, momentarily forgetting my own pain. I called my captain and explained what I'd come home to and what I'd done. He immediately sent two officers to collect me and two more to collect Detective Peterson. The next day, I was immediately transferred to a precinct on the other side of the city until I cooled down, and they took care of Peterson. They took care of Peterson? How? When the dust settled, my wife had left town with a cashier's check for all our money, Peterson was riding a desk, and no charges were filed against me. Then I learned my captain had talked to the bank manager the day after my altercation with the detective. Unfortunately for my wife, she didn't notice that the check wasn't signed. She was in such a hurry to get out of town because my fellow officers had warned her that I was hunting her with my service weapon. She tried for a few weeks to get someone to sign the check. However, by then, our accounts had been frozen. A month later, Peterson resigned when he realized the blue wall had closed ranks against him. I divorced my wife and made it so that she would have to fight for every penny she got. 
Last I heard, she was in California with all the other 304s. I can't say that the officer's story did much to lessen my pain, but at least it had opened the top to let a little seep out. My advice to you is simple, Officer Sullivan said suddenly. Don't do anything stupid. I know that you probably want to kill your wife or yourself. Don't do it. Time and distance will heal almost all wounds of the heart. After Officer Sullivan left me, I thought about what he had said. I decided I couldn't confront Amber in my current state. My dad had been after me to visit several manufacturers in the Midwest, from which we bought a lot of camping equipment. I was putting off the trip until the spring because I didn't want to subject myself to the freezing weather. Now, I decided to make that trip. I called my dad, headed home, and was thankful that Amber wasn't there. I quickly packed a bag, called Amber's cell phone, and again, luck was with me. My call went to voicemail. I left a message that I was going out of town on a business trip without any details. Frankly, I didn't think that she would give a shit. And I was right about that because she didn't call until the third day, and I let it go to voicemail. By the time I got home, I had cooled down and done a lot of thinking. Obviously, our marriage was over. I was still experiencing hurt beyond belief, but I wouldn't show it. When I entered the house, I called out and heard Amber rattling around in the den. She came strolling out and tried to kiss me. I pushed her away. We need to talk, I said, heading to the refrigerator for a beer. Once I had it, I sat down at the kitchen table. Okay, Amber said warily. What do we need to talk about? I want a divorce. She stared at me for several long moments and sighed. Oh well, it doesn't matter anymore. I guess you found out about Jimmy and me. I figured you might know because of how you went on that business trip. I also discovered that Jennifer and Todd aren't my kids. I snapped. She paled a little, but then a smirk appeared. I'm sorry you found out, but that doesn't matter anymore either. My eyes went wide, and I shook my head. I don't even know what to think about what you just said. Are you sorry you got caught? Are you sorry that you screwed Jimmy and got pregnant twice by him? Are you just sorry that I learned your dirty little secret? Are you sorry that I'm a clueless cuckold who loved you? What are you sorry about? Amber didn't even have the decency to be embarrassed. No, I was just sorry you learned about the kids. I intended to divorce you after my 35th birthday next week. I was going to simply tell you that I wasn't in love with you anymore. After a respectable amount of time, I would start dating Jimmy, and we'd get married. Then little by little, they'd accept Jimmy as their stepdad. Eventually, I'd tell them he was their real father when the time was right. They would be old enough to understand and accept it. What's so special about your 35th birthday? I asked because nothing still made any sense. I never told you, but my grandparents set up three separate trusts for me and my sisters. Each trust was funded with $7 million. However, the terms of the trust were that we had to be married by 25 and still married when we turned 35. At 35, the trust comes over to us with no conditions. My sisters are older and moved out of the area when they got married. And I asked them not to mention the trust because I didn't want it to screw up our relationship. They were more than happy to keep the trust secret. So, why didn't you just marry Jimmy? Because my grandparents were really old country. According to the trust, my parents had to approve of whomever I married. My dad, especially, hates Jimmy. I knew my parents were friends with your parents, so they wouldn't object to you. I was seething inside. Amber had wasted 17 years of my life cheated me out of my children, and lied to everyone just to get her grandparents' money. Now that was one stone-cold witch. I wanted to smack her so badly, but I knew that if I did, it would turn out badly for me. While I was away, I did a lot of reading on divorces and knew that violence would get you the opposite result from what you wanted. Well, Amber, you've achieved your goal, I sneered. Even if I filed for a divorce tomorrow, we won't be divorced before your 35th birthday. What a cold-hearted witch you are. Amber just smirked at me. Regardless of the consequences, I was so tempted to pop her in the face. It took all my willpower to restrain myself. Since you are a worthless and cheating 304, I will begin a divorce proceeding tomorrow, I said as calmly as I could. If you want to call me names, Justin, go ahead, Amber said as she rolled her eyes. But let's try to get through this as civilly as possible. I think a quick and quiet divorce will be best for everyone. I got right up in her face and said, screw you. Then I stepped back and spit on her. 
You can hate me all you want, she smirked again. I'm going to marry Jimmy, and there isn't anything you can do about it. Besides, there are the kids to be considered. What about the kids? I asked. You're not going to go broadcasting around that you're not their father, Amber said, a little unsure. I mean, you don't want everyone to know you've been a cuckold? I chuckled at this. I guess under the old definition of cuckold, I am one. The word comes from the cuckoo bird which lays its eggs in another bird's nest and lets them raise the chicks. By that definition, I am a cuckold. But the definition I use is when a wife cheats and her husband agrees to it. I certainly didn't agree with you cheating. And even by the old definition, the shame isn't on the husband. It's on the cheating 304. So, I don't give a flying crap if people think I'm a cuckold. The kids deserve to know. That is just like you, Justin. You'll throw your kids under the bus because your frail male ego has been bruised, Amber said with anger in her eyes. Oh, I'm not going to tell them, I smirked. You're going to tell them, and I'm going to be there when you do. And if you don't, I will show them pictures of you and Jimmy doing the dirty. Your choice. Of course, I had no pictures, but Amber didn't know that. She had to be wondering how I found out about them. Having pictures of them was quite logical. The truth was that I didn't find out about Amber and Jimmy. I found evidence that one of my kids might not be mine. My blood type is a positive, and Amber's is O positive. Jennifer is O positive, but Todd is B positive. With those blood types, it would be impossible for Todd to be my son. But I didn't want to believe it, so I had the DNA test done. Amber witched up a storm and threatened to publicly humiliate me. But I told her I'd talk to them with her, or without her. So we finally had a sit down with the kids. The following day, we were both waiting when the kids got home from school. Kids, come on in the kitchen. Your mother and I have something we need to tell you. I yelled when I heard them enter the front door. Jennifer and Todd sat down with total confusion written all over their faces. They looked from their mother to me and then back again. Kids, there is no easy way to tell you this, Amber said as she twisted a paper napkin, but your father and I are getting a divorce. The kids immediately went crazy and I had to calm them down. Let your mother finish and then we'll discuss it. It's nobody's fault, Amber began again, but I slammed my palm down on the table to stop her. For Christ's sake, Amber, I see that. Since you won't tell the truth, I will. You guys are old enough to handle it. However, before I begin, I want you to know I love you both unconditionally. I have no idea how your mother feels about you. You scum sucker, Amber flared. You know that I love my children as much as you do. Yeah, whatever. I sniffed at my soon-to-be ex-wife. Then I looked at both of my kids and saw the fear in their eyes. So I continued. Your mother has been cheating on me, so I'm going to divorce her. But there is more that you need to know. You're just going to be a real scum sucker about this, aren't you, Justin? Amber snapped. This is not easy for me, and it breaks my heart. But while your mother was cheating on me, she got pregnant by her lover and had both of you. I am not your biological father. Jimmy Swanson is. The kids didn't say anything right away. Both had tears running down their faces. It crushed my very soul to see them hurt like this. But at the same token, I knew it was best that they hear it from us rather than gossip that almost certainly would start swirling through the town. Why, Mom? Jennifer asked through her tears. Why would you do that to Dad, to us? Amber glared at me before turning toward her daughter. Because I love Jimmy Swanson. Let's get the whole truth out right now, I said with disgust for Amber. Your mother will inherit $7 million when she turns 35 if she is still married, which she will be. She couldn't marry Jimmy way back when because your grandparents objected to him. By the terms of the trust, if she married against her parents' wishes, your mother would have forfeited her inheritance. Todd was sobbing now, but Jennifer had gotten out of her seat and stood in front of her mother. You did all this for money? You destroyed us for money? For money? Jennifer stepped forward and slapped her mother as hard as she could. Then Jennifer lunged forward even further, knocking Amber to the floor. She was on her mother in a second, slapping and punching her as hard as possible. I had expected the discussion to be awkward and difficult, but I never expected it to get violent. It took all my strength to pull my 100-pound daughter off her mother. When I had control of Jennifer, I pushed her into the living room and told her to sit on the couch. Then I went back to check on Amber. 
She was slowly climbing to her feet, but her nose was bloody and her lip was bleeding. I hope you're proud of yourself, Justin, Amber said angrily. You've really screwed up your kids. Don't you even dare blame my dad for this mess, you witch, Jennifer screamed as she charged back into the kitchen. If you say one more bad word about daddy, I'll scratch your eyes out. Amber backed away from her daughter. It was clear that Amber was stunned and a little scared of her daughter. Amber, I think it might be best if you find somewhere else to stay for the next few days, I said, trying to sound calm and reasonable. At least until tempers have a chance to cool off. Amber was not happy but went off to pack a bag. Before she left, Amber stuck her head back into the kitchen. It's alright, kids. I still love you. If looks could have killed, then Jennifer's glare would have dropped her mother right then. Amber was smart enough to know she was pushing her luck and left. It took many hours to get the kids semi-calmed down. Todd was still crying when he went to bed that night, but Jennifer was terrified. Daddy, she asked while we were still sitting in the kitchen, will you still be our dad? I'd die if I lost you. Honey, you'll be 18 in less than a year, I said. Then you can decide what you want to do. Technically speaking, I don't think I have any parental rights. But understand one thing. You will always be my daughter, and I will always love you. Jennifer gave me a brave smile before I kissed her goodnight. Then I went over to Todd's room. He had finally stopped crying, but he looked totally miserable. Nobody slept very much that night. I lay awake, second-guessing myself, for insisting on the sit-down with the kids. But the more I turned it over in my head, I just couldn't see any better way to handle the situation. I suppose I knew the kids would react badly to the news. They both had always been much closer to me than their mother. Jennifer has always been my little princess, and Todd and I shared many interests. Also, as I lay there, something else was grinding at me. I now realized that all those supposed trips to visit her sisters were just a way so she could hook up with Jimmy. After my confrontation with Amber, she and Jimmy decided to begin their relationship publicly. Amber didn't think she had done anything wrong. She blamed everyone else for what she had done. It was her grandparents' fault for putting the stupid conditions in the trust. It was her parents' fault for disliking Jimmy so much. And of course, it was my fault for not being a proper husband. As I heard it, Amber was telling people that I was cold and distant. So she turned to Jimmy. Of course, she never said anything about the kids not being mine. Still, most of our friends looked at her like she had two heads. After hearing the stories, I got even angrier than when I first found out the truth. I began racking my brain for some way to get revenge against Amber and Jimmy. I think it's basic human nature, especially for a man, to want to strike back at a cheating spouse and their lover. However, the more I thought about it, the more I realized that I mostly wanted to get revenge against Amber. Jimmy was just a simple working guy. He was good-looking and pleasant, but Jimmy was not the mastermind behind all this. I was tempted to tell everyone that I wasn't Jennifer and Todd's biological father, but I couldn't do it because of what it might do to my kids. Yes, I considered them my kids, and no matter how things turned out, I would always consider them mine. As the days passed into weeks, I fell into a deep depression. My whole world had been shattered. The only thing that kept me from totally losing it was my work and the kids. After the disastrous confrontation between Amber and the kids, they stayed with me. They were the only light in my life. As the divorce moved along, Amber was smart enough not to push the issue even though she tried to reconnect with Jennifer and Todd. After a few calls, Amber stopped trying to contact her daughter. Jennifer was bitter beyond belief about what her mother had done. Their few calls degenerated into screaming matches laced heavily with profanity. On the other hand, Todd talked to his mother but he was always depressed after one of their short conversations. While Jennifer was not dealing well with her anger toward her mother and Jimmy, Todd, likewise, was not handling our breakup at all well either. Finally, I decided that all three of us needed to seek professional help. I set up meetings for all three of us with a family counselor, Mary Chaser. She wanted to meet with the three of us together and individually. The counselor also wanted Amber to attend the sessions. Surprisingly, Amber agreed to come. However, the first meeting of the four of us proved to be a huge mistake. I had to physically restrain Jennifer when Amber made a flip remark that the kids just needed to get over it. Afterward, I told Mary that if she wanted Amber at future sessions, we wouldn't be attending. 
Mary agreed that it would be wise to exclude Amber at this time. After that first meeting, a terrifying thought took hold of me. What if the court took the kids away from me and refused me any visitation rights? For weeks, I was haunted by the idea that I might never be able to see them again. My depression deepened. It was so deep that Mary prescribed anti-depression medication. It helped a little. At first, the counseling sessions seemed to do little, but as the weeks passed, I got a little better. While I still wanted to get revenge against Amber and Jimmy, I had to put it aside because Mary said that if I did something stupid, the court would almost certainly cut me off from my children. The final divorce hearing in court was a mess. The judge was pissed off at Amber after he read the petition. Amber's attorney was a horse's ass, and my attorney seemed more interested in sticking it to his opponent than representing me. But it was Jennifer who delivered one of two telling blows, and the judge delivered the other. The entire proceeding showed me and everyone else what a selfish, cold witch Amber was. Even though she had gotten access to her trust, which had grown to almost $10 million, she wanted her pound of flesh from me. Amber wanted half the marital assets, the house, alimony, and half of my 401k. My attorney explained the deception that Amber had perpetrated on me reasonably well, then tried to paint me as almost a saintly husband and father. After a few minutes, the judge told him to move on. However, his final appeal on my behalf was well thought out and emotional. He implored the court not to reward Amber's fraud. Then the question of custody was raised. Of course, Amber wanted full custody of the kids with limited visitation rights for me. I'm sure that Amber wanted to give me no rights because she blamed me for the terribly strained relationship with the kids. But I was also sure that her attorney advised her that the court would look dimly on trying to cut me out completely. I, of course, wanted full custody of the kids with liberal visitation rights for Amber. My attorney told me I was dreaming if I thought the court would side with me. Before the question of custody could be discussed, the judge asked the kids if they would prefer to talk to him privately in chambers. Jennifer jumped up and said loudly, No, your honor. I prefer to have what I say on the record. Todd stood up and said basically the same thing. Jennifer was the first to speak. Even though I could tell she was scared, Jennifer stood at the lectern and glared at her mother. Then she looked at me, smiled and mouthed, I love you. Jennifer looked briefly at her notes and then back at Amber. I'd like to direct my comments to the future, Mrs. Swanson, Jennifer began, and I saw Amber stiffen slightly. Even though my birth certificate says you are my mother, I no longer consider you as such. In my mind, my mother is dead. I want nothing to do with you, now or ever. I'll be 18 next year and legally make my own decisions. You were never there for me as I was growing up, so I won't be there for you in the future. That's not true, Amber cried out. The judge tapped his gavel. Please, your attorney has already presented your case in this divorce proceedings. We are considering the issue of custody, and I want to hear from the children. Do not interrupt again. Amber's face was beet red, and I didn't know if it was because she was embarrassed or mad. Anyway, I returned my attention to my daughter, and she continued. When I was five, I colored a picture for you. I waited all day for you to come home so I could give it to you. However, when I handed you the picture, you patted me on the head and told me I needed to color within the lines. Later I found the picture in the garbage can. Jennifer's face was getting red, and she was taking deeper breaths. Still, she pressed on. When I was nine, the carnival came to town. Dad told us we were all going. Todd and I were so pleased that we would all be going together. But you canceled at the last minute. I assume it was to be with your lover. Anyway, Dad took us and we had a great time. But it hurt that you didn't want to spend time with me. When I was 12, I got my first period. You were away somewhere. You always seemed to find excuses to be away. Dad found me crying with my pants bloody. He hugged me and explained what was happening to my body. Dad comforted me, telling me I shouldn't be scared or embarrassed by what was happening. Then he took me to the drugstore to get the necessary supplies I would need. When you came home and he told you what happened, you came into my room and handed me a box of sanitary napkins and a book about the female body. You told me I would find the answers in the book if I had any questions. Then you left. Dad was more of a mom than you ever were. And those are just a few of the many instances where you ignored me. Jennifer stopped for a moment, wiping a tear off her cheek, and glared at her mother again. 
What you did to my father was so cold, calculated, and selfish. For you to do what you did to a man who only wanted to love you has cut me to my soul. What you have done to Todd and me is beyond reprehensible. I consider you beneath contempt. My daughter's gaze shifted to Jimmy, and she lifted some dirt off the podium. As for you, Mr. Swanson, you may have contributed a speck of sperm to create Todd and me, but I care more for this piece of dirt than I do for you. Jennifer then spun around and looked at the judge. If you force me to live with her, I can guarantee there will be violence. So, in an attempt to forestall that, with the help of my grandfather's attorney, I have prepared a petition for emancipation. I want to be legally and completely separated from that woman. I want a divorce from the woman who calls herself my mother. The judge was surprised by Jennifer's statement, but took the petition and put it with his other papers. Todd was the next to speak, and he was a nervous wreck. He hated public speaking, but he also knew that he had to do it if he wanted his point of view to be heard. I'm, I'm, I'm really nervous, he stammered. I'm no good at speaking in public, but I have as many stories as Jen does about my mother's neglect, but I don't want to waste anyone's time. I just want to say that I don't want to go to live with that woman and that idiot. Todd paused, and his cheeks flushed red. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say jerk, even though that is what I think of him. And I can't even look at that woman without being totally disgusted. I don't want to live with her. I want to stay with the only dad I've ever known. Please don't make me go live with them. Todd pointed to his mother and Jimmy. Then he went and sat down. I watched Amber and Jimmy during the kids' presentations. Amber's face had turned even redder, and she was shaking. Jimmy, on the other hand, had only shown a slight anger when Todd called him an idiot. Jimmy was a pretty easygoing guy, but he obviously resented it when Todd talked disparagingly of him. Amber, she was not happy with her children at all, and I'm sure that she was going to blame me. I didn't care as I agreed with everything they had said. Amber had been less than a sterling mother. Now, everyone knew why. When the kids finished, I thought the judge would retire to consider his ruling, but he didn't. Usually, I take a few days to weigh both sides' arguments before rendering a decision. But this case is so straightforward that there is only one way that I feel I can rule. To begin with, this marriage was entered into for fraudulent purposes. Therefore, I am annulling it. It will be as though there was never a marriage. I don't know what that will do to your trust. I rather suspect nothing will happen because your parents were the only ones with any standing. However, someone might challenge you for the trust and you will have to defend yourself. Amber's face went from bright red to pale white in an instant. She seemed to wobble in her chair briefly until Jimmy pulled her to him. The judge watched Amber for a few seconds and then continued. Since there was no marriage, there are no marital assets as such. You both will take what you brought into your time together except for the house and Mrs. Williams' car. Even though it is clear that Mr. Williams paid for the car, it is titled in her name and will remain hers. The house is in both names, so I'm ruling that the proceeds will be split when the house is sold. In reviewing everything else, it appears that you, Mr. Williams, paid for about 90% of everything when you and Mrs. Williams lived together. Therefore, I'm ruling that all investments be split 90-10 unless Mrs. Swanson can provide documentation that she contributed more than 10%. I glanced over at Amber and saw a totally pissed off woman. Obviously, this court hearing was not going as she envisioned it would. As for me, I was pleasantly surprised by what was going on. I had read all the horror stories of the ex-husband getting raped by the courts. But the whole game changed as soon as the judge ruled there never was a marriage and I wasn't Amber's husband. Now, as to the question of custody, I understand that Jennifer and Todd are very emotional, so I must weigh that. If this was a traditional divorce, Jennifer would be old enough to choose who she wishes to live with. However, I cannot grant him custody since Mr. Williams isn't the biological father, and I've ruled that the marriage is annulled. However, since she has already filed a petition of emancipation from her mother, I will allow her to live with her grandparents if they are willing to take her. Jennifer will be under their supervision until a ruling is made on the petition for emancipation. In any event, in approximately a year, she can decide where she wants to live by herself. A quick glance over at Amber surprised me. There was a tear rolling down her cheek. Amber and Jennifer had never gotten along well, especially over the last five years. 
I just put it down to Jennifer being a rebellious teenager. I likened it to my sister, and my mother always butted heads during her high school years. Now they were like two peas in a pod. But that was never going to be Amber and Jennifer's relationship. Amber's betrayal of our family destroyed any relationship with her daughter, at least for the foreseeable future. As to the custody of Todd Williams, the judge said with a grimace, I understand that he is extremely upset with his mother and would like to live with Mr. Williams. Again, Mr. Williams has no standing in the custody determination. Therefore, I am awarding custody to Mrs. Williams and recommending that she grant liberal visitations to Mr. Williams. However, I can't order you to do so. And since Todd will be living with his mother, I will allow Mrs. Williams to remain in the house. But, outside of your obligation to the bank, Mr. Williams, I can't order you to make the mortgage payments. The judge looked quickly around the room and said, Unless there is something else, we stand adjourned. Todd stood up so fast that he knocked his chair over. Then he stalked from the room, crying. Amber stood up and glared at me as Jennifer came over, giving me a hug. I kissed Jennifer on the cheek and told her I'd take her and Todd to lunch if Amber permitted Todd to come. Then I talked to my attorney about getting the judge's ruling on the house reversed. He didn't think there was any chance of that. So, I would have to put the squeeze on Amber to pay her half, but if she refused, I would make the payments. There was too much equity to lose. Besides, my attorney said that when the house was sold, I could petition the court to be reimbursed for any payments I made on the house over 50%. Once in the hallway, I heard Todd yelling at Amber and Jimmy. I walked up and told Todd to calm down and go wait outside. This he did reluctantly. Amber turned on me, mad as hell. You think you've won, she poked me in the chest, but I got the house and the love of my life. As much as I didn't think Amber could hurt me anymore, her rant cut me deep. I wanted to slap her silly and beat the shit out of Jimmy. So, it took all my willpower to keep calm and smile. Would it be alright if Todd comes to lunch with Jennifer and me? I asked pleasantly. Screw you, she hissed. No, Todd will not be seeing you today or ever. I don't want you to corrupt him like you did to my daughter. If you believe that, then you are the stupidest 304 on this planet. I snapped back. The self-control was slipping. Hey, watch your mouth. Jimmy threatened me. Jimmy, if you touch me, I will beat the shit out of you. And you know I can do it. I strongly suggest you back off. Jimmy saw the look in my eyes and decided not to push me. When I was sure he wouldn't be a problem, I turned back to my never-was-wife. I decided to go on the attack. Amber, you are undoubtedly one of the most selfish people in the world. Let me clue you in on a few things. First of all, you're not special. Sex with you was pretty crappy, but then you got all you wanted from your sex toy. Also, if I had to do it all over again, knowing what I know now, I would do it again if I could be assured of having the same kids. It has always been about the kids with me. I was stuck with you because it was a package deal, but I love them more than anything. So, screw you. I hope you have a horrible, misery-laden life. When I finished, I was out of steam, so I had to get out of there before I lost control completely. I turned and headed out the door. I could hear Amber calling me a pathetic loser. She was ranting that I wasn't half the man Jimmy was, and sex with me was nauseating for her. Todd did not take it very well when I told him his mother said no to having lunch with us. I told him I was sorry, but the courts had tied my hands. He started to cry and beg me to take him with me. Until then, I didn't think I could feel any worse. I was wrong. I hugged him and told him he had to go with his mother, but I wouldn't stop until I could get him back. The next six months were the worst of my life. I was filled with anger, rage, sadness, and deep depression. Amber appealed the judge's decision about the division of the assets, and I sued on behalf of the children to overturn the trust that Amber had received. I pointed out that since there had not been a marriage, Amber hadn't fulfilled the terms of the trust but I lost in both cases. The appeals court said that even though I had been tricked into marrying Amber and our marriage had been annulled, they viewed her contribution to the household worth more than 10%. They awarded Amber 40% of our joint assets. However, my 401, K was exempted. As for the trust, the courts ruled that Jennifer and Todd had not been mentioned in the trust, and as such, they had no standing. And of course, the court had ruled, I was never married to Amber so I had less than no standing. 
They said that the trustees of Amber's grandparents were the only ones standing. And since Amber's parents and grandparents were all dead, Amber was now the sole trustee. Besides, the court viewed our living together as a form of common law marriage. As crushing as the two losses in court were, what was totally frustrating to me was that I had not been able to get even a little revenge against either Amber or Jimmy. And what made it worse was that I would constantly see them around town. They acted like teenagers in love, holding hands, hugging, and kissing in public. It seemed that everywhere I went, they were there, and the emotional turmoil would start over again. I couldn't take it anymore, so I moved to a town 15 miles away. Because of how the school districts were drawn, Jennifer didn't have to change schools. And of course, since Todd lived with Amber, his school didn't change. I tried to block it out and put Amber behind me, but I couldn't. I kept having the same recurring dream. It would be Jimmy screwing Amber, and he'd be smirking at me. Then he'd tell me, watch while I put a baby in your wife. I was hardly sleeping, and I wasn't eating properly. The only good thing to happen during those first six months was Todd. He made himself such a pain in the ass that Amber finally called me to take him. It was one of the few times I chuckled during those dark months. As Todd ran out of my old house with his bag, Amber and Jimmy came out on the porch to say goodbye. Surprising to me, Amber had tears flowing down her cheeks. Jimmy just looked relieved. As Todd ran toward my car, Amber called out, I love you. Todd didn't break stride, but threw his middle finger toward his mother and Jimmy. This caused Amber to begin sobbing uncontrollably. I'm not going to apologize for feeling good about the situation. However, Jimmy put his arm around Amber and they hugged tightly. That turned my satisfaction into anger, but I didn't do anything except get back in the car and take Todd to my place. I arranged for Todd to stay in his same school until the end of the year. I had rented a three-bedroom, two-bath house, and I believed that having Jennifer and Todd with me was the only thing that kept me from going totally insane and doing something truly stupid. Also, my obsession with getting revenge against the cheaters continued to fester. And still, I couldn't devise a plan that wouldn't land me in jail. However, I must admit that there were times I would say to myself, screw it, I'll just kill them even though I knew I'd go to jail. But the thought of what would happen to my kids forced those plans from my head. My kids were totally supportive of me, and I tried the best I could to pull my act together. I knew that Jennifer and Todd were near frantic about my deteriorating condition. Finally, Jennifer stepped up big time, taking over running the house. She cooked, cleaned, and made sure Todd got to school and did his homework. Also, Jennifer tried to make sure I ate and that I went to work. Finally, nine months after the annulment, it all came to a head. I had a full-blown panic attack at work. I collapsed in my office, and I was having trouble breathing. Everyone thought I was having a heart attack. An ambulance took me to the hospital, where they ran a battery of tests. When they decided I'd had a severe panic attack, I was referred to a therapist. I balked at going, but my dad said that if I didn't go, he'd see the kids were taken away from me. My therapist, and Summers, was really good. She explained that I was suffering from PTSD, the same as someone who had been in combat or who had lost a loved one. Ms. Summers explained that I had to go through the five stages of grief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally, acceptance, and explained that I had gotten stuck between anger and depression with no chance to bargain. Amber had presented a fait accompli, and there was no negotiation. My panic attack had been my body's first warning of what the tremendous stress was doing to me. If I let things continue, eventually, it would kill me. While I couldn't argue with Anne's assessment, I had no idea how to change it. Fortunately, she did. I was instructed to keep a journal of every bad thought I had about Amber and Jimmy. At the end of each, I was to write, I forgive them. At each session, I was required to read my darkest thoughts about my never wife and we'd discuss them. One of my thoughts was to blow Jimmy's head off with a shotgun. After a bit of discussion, I admitted that I'd never be able to live with myself if I killed someone, even if it was Jimmy. Then and asked what the kids would think if I did something like that. I readily admitted that they would probably lose all respect for me. And so, it went with every one of my hateful thoughts. It always came back to kids. Little by little, I let most of the anger go, and my life got better. About the same time, I was going to therapy, 
I realized that Jennifer was filled with hate herself. She snapped at almost everyone except for Todd and me. Jennifer even snapped at her grandfather at times. Finally, my father urged me to get the kids more counseling. This I did immediately. As Jennifer and Todd went to their counseling sessions, I was politely told that they were private. Jennifer never told me what she told the therapist, but Todd was always a motor mouth. He told me everything he discussed. He told me how much anger he carried for his mother. Todd felt she had abandoned them and betrayed the family, especially me. But as angry as Todd was with his mother, he told me Jennifer's anger was a hundred times worse. I can't explain why, but this made me very sad. Two years after the annulment, Todd would at least talk to his mother. They weren't what you would call warm conversations. Still, he was polite, and I could see that Amber appreciated the minimum contact even though she wanted more. But Jennifer refused to speak to or have anything to do with her mother. About four years after the annulment, Jennifer got married. I tried to get her to invite her mother and Jimmy. Jennifer absolutely refused. I told her I was concerned she was hanging on to so much anger. Jennifer smiled, reached up, and kissed me on the cheek. I'm not angry anymore, Dad. People think that the opposite of love is hate, but it isn't. The opposite of love is indifference. I am totally indifferent toward that woman. I simply don't care what she does, says, or thinks. She ignored me and betrayed our family. I was angry, but now I just don't care about her. And we all have people that we don't want to associate with, and she is one of those people for me. Having her around would ruin my wedding day, so neither of them is coming. After being betrayed by Amber, didn't think I'd ever get married again. But a year before Jennifer got married, I decided to marry Jean Wilder. Jean pushed the issue after we had been dating for over a year. She told me if I wasn't going to ask her to marry me, she would look for someone else. Jean was very upfront about wanting a family, so I had to make up my mind one way or the other. I chose Jean. It was the best decision of my life. When we married, it felt like I was finally living again. The demons of my past marriage had finally been put to rest. Of course, neither Jimmy nor Amber were invited to my wedding. The next three years were good ones. Jennifer gave birth to a boy, Justin, and 18 months later a girl, Christina. She wouldn't allow either Amber to visit her in the hospital, and they weren't invited to the christenings. Also, Amber wasn't invited to birthday parties or any holidays. Jennifer had cut Amber completely out of her life. Over the years that followed, I didn't see much of Amber or Jimmy. Now, at least, if I did see them, it didn't send me into an emotional spiral. I had gotten like Jennifer. I was indifferent toward Amber. But suddenly, Amber had reached out to me and wanted to meet to discuss the children. I was very uncomfortable doing this, but I felt it had to be done. I made my way over to Amber's table. She looked up at me hopefully. I nodded and slid into the booth across from her. You're looking well, Amber, I said pleasantly. Where's Jimmy? Amber's face reddened slightly. We're taking a break from each other for a bit. I'm sorry to hear that, I said, even though I wasn't sorry. In fact, I already knew that Jimmy had split. I didn't know for sure, but I surmised that Jimmy thought he was on easy street when my ex-wife came into her inheritance. However, Amber had grown tired of Jimmy being a sponge. She wanted him to get a job, and he didn't think too highly of that idea. Whether he was coming back again or not, I didn't know or care. I just wanted to get this meeting over, so I pressed on. What did you want to talk about? I pressed. I heard you got married a while back and you're expecting, she said with a half smile. Congratulations, now you'll have a child of your own. I'll have three children, I said as I stiffened with anger. Amber saw that she had made a huge mistake. I'm sorry, that was totally thoughtless, and I didn't mean it the way it came out. I meant to say that I'm happy you're having a child with someone who loves you. My muscles relaxed, and I accepted the apology at face value. Again, what want to talk about? Justin, it's killing me that Jennifer refuses to see me or even talk to me, Amber sobbed. I haven't even seen my two grandchildren. I want to be part of hers and their lives. It was on the tip of my tongue to say that if she had been part of Jennifer's life way back, when there would be no problem today. But I held my tongue and decided to take the high road. What exactly do you want me to do? I asked. Jennifer listens to you, Amber said desperately. If you tell her to talk to me, she will listen. For what it's worth, I have talked to her. 
I tried to get her to invite you and Jimmy to the wedding. I tried to get her to invite you to the christenings and birthday parties. I even suggested we invite you when we were planning Christmas at my house. Not only did Jennifer say no to my suggestions, but she threatened to stay home if I invited you to Christmas. She hates me so much, Amber said with despair. No, she doesn't hate you, I said firmly. In her mind, you didn't care for her when she was little, and now that she's grown up, she doesn't care for you. You chose your life, and she's chosen hers. I wish I could convince her differently, but I've had no impact so far. I'm sorry. Amber began to sob softly, and I patted her hand lightly. I promise I'll keep trying. Maybe someday, Jennifer will soften. I've created such a mess, Justin, she said through tears. I was so selfish and cruel. I'm so sorry. I know that doesn't mean anything now, but I am truly, truly sorry. I left Amber crying in the booth. When I got to my car, my wife, Jean, was waiting with curiosity written all over her face. So, what did your never wife want to talk to you about? Exactly what you thought she would, I said sadly. Amber wants me to help her get back in Jennifer's life. What is that they say? My wife asked. You are the sum total of all your decisions in life. Yeah, that's so true, I agreed. However, despite all of the shit that Amber rained down on me, I still feel sorry for her. As I headed for home, it struck me that all that time I spent trying to devise some sort of revenge on Amber was a total waste of energy. Amber had done it to herself. She had created her own hell and was living in it every day. Subscribe to the channel if you liked the video so you don't miss out on the next one. Thank you.